The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. Coming, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's uh, philosophy symposium on the topic of justice and the free market. Um, uh, I just say a couple words. I'm going to actually pass it on to our students in a minute. I mean, one of the things that's I think really special about TLU is the opportunity that students <coughs> have here to really be involved in the academic life of a university and to be involved in organizing. And really, this philosophy symposium is a very good example because the entire thing has been organized by a couple of our philosophy majors. So, uh, I mean, everything from the selection of the topic, from contacting the speakers, from arranging the, uh, uh, the rooms, I mean, the whole thing has been done by students. And it's really, I think, uh, fairly unique. And it's also a tribute to the students, Jane Allen, Stokes, and Ian Nutting. And so we're very proud of our philosophy majors for doing this. Um, <laughs> Don't tell them that too often, but it's true. <laughs> and um, I'm going to continue with letting the students organize uh, and run everything by having Jane Allen introduce our first speaker. Let me remind you, though, there's another speaker tonight at 7 o'clock speaking in the chapel. So if you have a chance uh, to come this evening, I'd encourage you to come this evening to hear our, our evening speaker uh, tonight at 7 in the chapel. Like, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Maria Paganelli, um, who comes from Trinity University in San Antonio, where she currently is the Assistant Professor of Economics. Her research interest includes Adam Smith, uh, David Hume, and Monetary Theory, uh, and the Scottish Enlightenment. She has published, or she has published in The History of Political Economics, uh, the Journal of the History of Economic, Economical Thought, or, yeah and in the history of economic ideas. Um, the European Society for History of Economical Thought awarded her the HOPE 2008, um, the Adam Smith Problem in uh, Reverse, Self-Interest in Adam Smith's Wealth of the National and Theory of Moral uh, Sentiment. The, the pri it, the, it's a prize for best article of the year in 2009. Um, she received her PhD in economics from George Mason University, and her presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. So please help me welcome Dr. Maria Pignani. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here, and it is even a bigger pleasure to um, have been invited by students. I didn't realize how heavily involved the students were in this as like after a few email exchanges like this is a student who's inviting me and it seems like everything is run by students. I was really very impressed by this so congratulations in just the fact that you've been able to put together uh, a symposium like this. So it's, it's fantastic that you have this opportunity and you're taking advantage of it. Um, and thank you also for, to the university for inviting me here. It's really a big pleasure. Um, what I um, was asked was, uh, well, can you talk about markets and justice? Like, I don't know, I can try at least. Um, I work mostly in Ad on Adam Smith. Um, Adam Smith is a Scottish philosopher that wrote also about theory of moral sentiment, so that gives me the lead way into the justice part. Uh, and the fact that he's considered the father of economics allows me to talk about markets and justice. Um, even though this particular work is not explicitly about uh, market and justice, but it gives you a different take on some aspects of justice. And in particular, what I, what I um, asked uh, myself is, are markets moral? Is it possible to have markets and morality going hand in hand. So it's a slightly different question than justice, but nevertheless related. And uh, one of the reasons why I was intrigued by this question is because of all the fuzz with uh, uh, 2008, the financial crisis, and then um, Occupy Wall Street movement, where there is a very strong uh, position um, and some very strong opinions criticizing certain kinds of markets. And so I was questioning whether 
all markets are the same. So there are some aspects of markets and of market societies that can be sab uh, saved. And if you want to, since I, uh, some of you um, are in philosophy, if you want to link this to some of the more philosophical, general philosophical theme, think of the idea of the noble savage. Have you heard of this? Uh, please interrupt me at any time um, or, or ask questions at any time. Have you heard the idea of the noble savage? What is it? And if it's outside society, is it a better person or a worse person? Or if it's outside uh, markets, is it a better person or a worse person? Worse as in outside society, but it's better because we're here inside society. Right. So part of the myth uh, of the, the savages, the noble savages at least, is that in the past, people without markets were much better off. They were much better people. Um, and they live happily together and everybody cared about each other and then market and civilization came in or civilization came in and then markets came in and they ruined them. And now you're all like nasty, greedy per people and you just say, it's mine because I can't get it. So that is, is the stereotype that you, we tend to have when we think about, or one of the stereotypes against markets and the relationship that markets may have with morality when we think about uh, how markets can affect our moral behavior or not. Um, and so I was intrigued by, by trying to analyze this, um, these aspects of uh, the interaction between mor markets and morality to see whether it was possible to have an alternative and what kind of alternative uh, you would have to the greedy uh, person who's like me, 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 only mine, uh, and I don't care about the rest of the world. Um, which is a possibility, and I'm not, say, I'm not denying it, but I'm just saying this is the only aspect that we have once we face markets. And so I looked at Adam Smith, simply because that's a convenient place for me to look, given that's what, what I study. And also my other, uh, my other side, my dark side, is the, the real economist part. Um, works with experiments, experimental economics. So I tried to look at the, the area of my expertise, Scottish Enlightenment and experimental economics, to try to see if I could find answers to uh, the possibility of interaction between markets and, mor and morality. And the answer that I found is yes, it is possible to have morality and markets going hand in hand. Why do I care? Why should, well, why do I care, why should you care about the interactions between markets and morality? Well, to me the first reason is because morality is a very cheap way of enforcing contracts. If I think that uh, I should keep my promises, I don't need to have a, a very big enforcement system outside paid with my taxes to enforce that contract because I will keep my promise. So if you have a society where promises are kept simply because it is the right thing to keep promises, you're going to have very low enforcement costs, meaning that you don't have to bring to court every time somebody, or you don't have to threat somebody to bring them to court um, if they don't uh, fulfill their promises. So to, have a, a strong sense of morality is a very, very cheap way to maintain laws. And countries where there is a strong sense of morality and therefore there is a, in, which is measured um, by a different uh, variable, which is uh, in economics we would use the trust variable. So countries where there is a higher level of trust tend to be countries where there is a higher economic growth. Countries with low level of trust, on the other hand, have low level of economic growth. This is, 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 a, is a common um, result within, within economics. We, yeah. So between countries also between people? Between people. Like do I, if, I, if, I, if you promise me that uh, you're going to take me around campus afterwards, can I trust you? Or I left my purse there. 
right, is right in front of you. Am I, why did I leave it there? Because I trust you and her enough to think that you're not gonna put your hand in it and, say, and steal my wallet, right? So this is, a, in a sense, a small gesture that, I, I, that I've done unconsciously. I just think, I just look at it and saw that my purse was there. But think instead, <laughs> but which represents the fact that the trust that I have is high enough to leave it there. If I didn't trust you, then I would have had, when I walked to the podium, I would have had to take this with me and put it here, right? Which is a little, is, is not much, but is a little bit more of my energy that was taken away from coming here, right? So that is, is a small example that tells you if I have a high level of trust, I don't have to worry about my purse. And so I can dedicate all my energy in doing something else, economic growth. On the other hand, if I'm worried, like, you're gonna steal everything from me, then I'm gonna be much tense during the whole talk, and like, oh, where's my purse, where's my purse? And somebody's behind me, and they're gonna put it in a way, so, so th that takes away energy from me, which distracts me from the presentation, which lowers the quality of the presentation, right? So this is a, is a, is a tiny, tiny example, but you can magnify it at a country level. <coughs> So in a countries in which you can concentrate more on, okay, you promise that you're going to deliver certain goods to me tomorrow, fine, I don't have to worry about you actually delivering because I know that you will. So I can concentrate on preparing everything so when you deliver your goods, everything is ready, then I can build everything faster. Does this make sense? Is this okay so far? So th that trust is like, why do you deliver the goods to me? Exactly, because you trust that I will pay you. Similarly, I'm gonna put my purse back there because otherwise I will trip on it. <laughs> um, why, do, why aren't you stealing my wallet, even if you have the chance? Fear of what? Mm -hmm. So that is a, a one reason why you wouldn't steal my wallet. It's like, oh, I'm afraid that somebody will actually <coughs> see me and then yeah. that they're gonna have problem with the school. Would you steal my wallet? Yeah. Why? Yeah. That's exactly the reason. So in your case, I need a policeman around, <laughs> right? <laughs> in her case, on the other hand, I don't. That means that the salary of the policeman can be used to do something more productive. Right. Does it make sense? Yeah. So that is the idea when I say morality is a very cheap way of enforcing laws, of law enforcement, because I don't need to have the police, I don't need to have a court with her, while in and so my, my costs are, of being here are very low. On the other hand, if, if everybody was more or less like you in a, in a more enhanced way, then I would have to hire a security guard to come with me and make sure that my wallet is gonna stay there. So I'm, I'm using resources in an unproductive way in this way. Is this okay so far? Um, and uh, so the, the reason why as I'm interested in looking at the relationship between markets and morality is to see if they can go hand in hand and in which way they can. And the third reason, is, so this is in part because of the Occupy Wall Street um, ideas. And the third reason is a selfish reason. It's, I'm interested in 18th century, and I don't want um, to think that 18th century uh, writings is useless. So anything, anytime I find something that, ah, oh, see, you should read 18th century <laughs> Scottish Enlightenment, that's a good reason for me. <laughs> no, and that in general, that also means, uh, I'm, I'm more serious about this, it's just like we have a huge amount of wealth, uh, intellectual wealth, that has been written before us. And there is, at least in economics, there is a tendency to ignore anything that is more than 15 years old. And so to have a reminder that there are lessons to be learned also from older texts um, is a good lesson to keep in mind. That simply because something is old doesn't have to be dismissed as useless or old. So how do we actually, um, look at what Adam Smith has to say about uh, markets and morality. 
And the way in which I approach it is like, well, I, I'm going to look at um, the Wealth of Nations, which is the major economics uh, book, and the Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is the, the other book, um, for an economist at least, and see what Smith has to say about the presence of commerce and the presence of markets. And I found not only that Smith justify markets because markets are efficient, which an economist knows, uh, but also that Smith may be able to justify markets because markets may enhance morality in three ways. Markets seem to support life, markets seem to support liberty, and markets seem to support impartiality, and impartiality is a prerequisite for justice. And I'm going to elaborate on the three of them. So if you assume that life, liberty, and impartiality are value to support, moral value to support, then you see that markets in Smith may provide an environment that fosters them and, allow, and allows them to, um, to grow. So let's look at the first um, part. When I, when I say that for Smith, markets and morality may go hand in hand uh, because market may support life. And life is uh, a value that uh, ought to be supported. So Smith opens the wealth of nations with a, with a short introduction to the book. And it tells us we live in a strange world in which a lot of commerce has been introduced and a lot of wealth is introduced. Before us, people were poor because people didn't know markets as much as we know. And what happened before us? People were so poor that they were forced to be bad, to be immoral, to do things that today we consider horrible such as having their elderly, their sick, and their children, children abandoned and devoured by wild beasts. Those are these words. I just, I just love the, 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 <laughs> the image of like having these wild beasts devouring your children and your, your grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very vivid image. But it tells you, you have this wild beast devouring your grandfather because your gra you, don't, you can't support your grandfather. You have this wild beast devouring your, chi your child because you can't afford to support him. You have to abandon your children, your sick, and your elderly because you don't have the means of supporting them. And that's what poverty uh, generates. It generates the conditions in which you're forced to commit actions that are horrible on a moral ground. Because it is horrible to the idea of abandoning your child. It is horrible to abandon your, your sick or your elderly. But you're forced to do it by poverty. And as uh, Smith progresses in the Wealth of Nations, there is another situation in which he explains something very similar to it. He describes China at this time. Now, Smith writes in, in a time in which political correctness did not exist. And so, again, it is, is colorful presentation of some groups, um, today maybe a little bit um, not exactly correct. But at this time, political correctness was not an issue, so it tells you China is very poor. At least there are some segments of China that are very, very poor. They are so poor that they behave like the rest of the world when the, the rest of the world was poor, which means that they're going to kill children because they can't support them. And so Smith tells us, and these are his words, that the poorest part of the Chinese population, because of their poverty, are going to drown their children at, like puppies in the water. Those are like, if you, if you take this seriously, it's a very abhorrent uh, practice that Smith is describing. Well, would you say that poverty creates anxiety? Yes, that's exactly what Smith is, is, is 
basically hinting at. That poverty gives you conditions in which you're forced to be, to do things that are immoral. And on the other hand, when you have the means to support life, you do. And so in all <coughs> civilized society, I'm using the word civilized because that's uh, Smith's language, but in all commercial society, as soon as you become wealthy, you don't abandon your children anymore. You don't drown your children by puppies anymore. You don't abandon your sick, and you don't abandon your elderly to be devoured by wild beasts. That's exactly Smith's point, yes. That if you don't have the means to survive, you're forced to do actions that are immoral. And once you have the means, you immediately step back and you say those are abhorrent, and that's a, uh, Smith's word, abhorrent practices of the past. Yes, that's exactly what Smith says. Yeah. It is an acceptable practice which still remains immoral. But you're forced to do it, so you, you do it. You're, for, you, you, you're forced in the sense that it's either, like, you just don't, you're not able to support the child. So it's fair for society to have, you know, a higher thought of, say, say they didn't have that food stamp. Mm -hmm. Smith doesn't present it in terms of knowledge. There, there are certain things that like leave sort of unsaid, let's put it like this. It takes for granted that the life of a child, the life is good, and the life of a child is good. It actually is a little bit more explicit about the life of a child as co compared to the life of an elderly. Because if you hear about the death of a child, you're much more uncomfortable than if you hear the death of a very old person. Because you think that the child still have a life to live and it didn't have the opportunity while a very old person already lived their life. So Smith takes for granted that um, there is, that life is a good thing. So it's not knowledge necessarily, it just is something that comes from the fact that you're alive and therefore that's a good thing. Does it does it does he answer that? Yes. Yes. Um, I would use a slightly different word than luxury. Um, in if I'm going to use a technical economic <coughs> word, so please uh, try to bear with me. But in economics, we would say th uh, that uh, morality is a normal good, as opposed to a luxury good. Normal good simply means that you are going to consume more of it the higher your income. So it's not necessarily a luxury good. It's just something that you, you're, you're happy to consume more once you have the money to do it. Hmm? Can you make a distinction about markets? Some markets support life, but other markets might not. An unregulated market uh, controlled by an oligarchy, for yeah. example, may not be supportive of life in Central America in the 1980s. Indeed, indeed. Um, and as a, uh, this is something that we'll cover later on, but I'm happy to, to mention it right now. Um, Smith is furious against certain uh, situations in which the market has been um, attacked and, and uh, taken by uh, specific groups. And so just to put myself ahead, uh, because we are talking about life and death, um, Smith is very, very, very um, passionate about criticizing um, the East Indian Company, which monopolized the trade with the, the East India. And he says, look at Bengal. Bengal is a very fertile land. Bengal is a, is, is a, doesn't have an overpopulation problem in the normal condition. Before the British went there, Bengal was a very fine place. People were able to live their life, their, their population was fine. The East Indian Company takes monopoly over Bengal, the, over the trade of Bengal, and now Bengal has thousands of people dying every year of hunger. 
And Smith says, this is one of the most fertile land in the area. Why are people dying off? Exactly because the markets have been captured by special interest groups. And that's a, 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 a deformation of, of certain form of markets, indeed. So the problem of life and death is very present on both sides. Yes. Mm -hmm. As you get wealthier, you can afford to do some things that wouldn't be as more attractive otherwise. And the market does that because the market produces wealth. Exactly. That's what they're saying. But on the other hand, the market will also provide what people want. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, a market, there was a market for snuff films. That does not support life mm -hmm. by definition. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and I, when I use markets because it's a word that we are more familiar with than commerce, but Smith used the word commerce. And when you use the word commerce, it means markets, but also means a commercial society. So it's a whole structure of uh, social interaction that comes about with the introduction of markets in all forms. So it's not just one market specific, but it's a market able society, so, I don't know how, it, it, there is no word that, that I'm aware of at least, um, that um, would qualify with the word markets. So Smith actually uses the word commerce. And commerce is, is a broader sense than just market, because then market then may give you the tendency of thinking, oh, the market for some illegal or, uh, or immoral activities, it is a market, but that's not what Smith is necessarily talking about, is the structure of society that relies on, on markets or commerce as a primary form of subsistence, as opposed to feudal societies or um, agricultural society. So those are the, the, the things that he's comparing. Is okay so far? Yeah, did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and so Smith goes on saying, when societies become wealthy, um, you will have enough wealth to support life of children, elderly, and sick, um, and sick. And those are the commercial societies. Now, you can say, okay, so you have a lot of people alive, which is a good thing, but they're all enslaved. Is it, a good, is it just as good? Well, Smith says, you know what? It's a, it's a good thing to have a lot of people alive and to support all of them. It's even better if those people are alive and free, as opposed to alive and enslaved. And this is what actually commerce does. Commerce allows, or the development of commerce, the introduction of commerce, allows people to um, become freer, or to break some of the, the enslavements that they have. <coughs> so commerce or markets enhance freedom. Smith tells us in non-commercial society, the, the way in which you, you relate with others is personal relations. Right? You ask somebody for food, not if you can't ask somebody for food if you don't know that person. To whom are you going to ask for food? To somebody that you know and to somebody um, that is going to ask you for some services back. In particular, what I'm referring to are, so I mentioned the feudal society. Feudal society are very personal society in the sense that there you have um, a lord with a, lo a lot of people dependent on the, the lord to receive uh, subsistence. And in exchange, they would offer services to the lord. Does it make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Smith tells you this kind of personal relation is dependency, which means it can be tyrannical. Because if your Lord says, you're going to do that, you have to do it. 
Otherwise, you're on the street with nothing, and nobody is going, going to support you. So when I, when I say, or when Smith says, a personal relation, don't think of, oh, hi, my name is Maria. I'm going to be your server tonight. No, it's not that kind of personal relation. It's literally like dependency that you have from another person. That your 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 likely the, your um, your chances of surviving are dependent on somebody else. Hmm. On the other hand, when commerce is introduced, do you know the person who fed you lunch today? Did did you? How did you get lunch? Yeah, I'm asking you. Uh, no, the the lady in front. Sorry. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you know who made it? No. no, that's exactly the point. You have no idea who made your lunch. Do you know the person who served you the lunch? No, no. that's a normal thing, right? This is a, is a, is a somebody cooks lunch for you, gives you lunch, and you have no idea who, the, who these people are. Those are the impersonal relations that Smith is talking about through commerce. Commerce allows you to have lunch without knowing that person. And the fact that you don't, you don't have to know that person, you don't have to uh, clean their shoes um, to get the lunch, implies that you are free from them, right? And they are free from you. So there is a, a relationship between the two of you, but it's not of dependency. You're, you are independent of that person that gave you lunch, <coughs> and the person who gave you lunch is independent of you. Does that make sense? And that means that you're free, right? That you're, you're not in chain to that person. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this. Um, this is, these are Smith's word. Um, commerce and manufacturers gradually introduced order and good government. And with them, the liberty and security of individuals among the inhabitants of the country, who had before lived almost in continual state of war with their neighbors and of servile dependency upon their superior. So Smith tells you, before commerce and manufacturers were introduced, people were in servile dependency upon their superiors. The majority of people were not the lords. The majority of people were the people who were serving the lords, right? So the majority of people were in servile dependence, dependency with, um, upon their superiors, the very few superior, very few lords. You introduce commerce, you introduce liberty. I'm gonna work on security in a little bit. Does it make sense? How does it work? Smith tells you, before uh, commercial society, societies become um, the predominant form of, um, of, of uh, social interactions, there were very few com commercial interactions, very few market transactions. Most of the lords were able to produce whatever they had on their own uh, land. They had all these servants that were um, helping him with the, um, with the managing of, uh, of his property. And they had nothing to buy because there were no markets. So they consumed what they produced, and that's about it. So the only way to show off was through what Smith calls a rustic hospitality which means that if somebody walks by or comes by your, um, your castle, you invite them in, you have a big banquet. And you see like in movies, like this, those big banquets, that's basically the, the extent in which a lord can show off. But then he introduced commerce. You introduce trade. You introduce things that are produced from far away. You introduce what Smith calls trinket and baubles. What are they? are diamond buckles. That's what like, Smith is all intrigued by, these diamond buckles. <laughs> and so like a lord sees a diamond buckle, and says, oh, a diamond buckle, that is so cool. If I have it, everybody will admire me. And so the lord wants to buy the diamond buckle. 
How does it do it? It needs money. How do you get the money? You sell the land. And if you sell the land, then you lose your title. You have a diamond buckle, but that's about it. And that's basically how Smith describes the crumbling of the feudal society and the emergence of commercial society. The Lord starts selling off their birthrights, their land, to get trinket and bubble, to get the diamond buckle. But then what happens? If you don't have the land that is going to support you, what are you going to do with all the slaves that you had, with all the people that, uh, that live on your land? You had, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I said yank. Yeah, <laughs> they, ha they can run, they can, they can leave because the Lord is not going to be able to support them anymore. So the, the, the people that before were serving the Lord, now they're still serving the Lord, but with a paycheck. Right? So now, uh, uh, say a shoemaker is going to offer shoes not just to the Lord like he did before, but also to another lord or to other people who are willing to buy shoes. So Smith tells you, you are going to change the relationship of uh, the interpersonal relationship from being personal to being impersonal in the sense that with the lord you have only one master, which can be tyrannical, doesn't have to, but it can be tyrannical, to a thousand masters. Now you don't have to give shoes only to one person. And if that person doesn't like your shoes, then, then you have a problem. But you, you, now you can give shoes to a thousand people, <coughs> to a thousand masters, which means that if one doesn't like your shoes, too bad. I have another 999 with whom I can feed myself. And so Smith tells you, you generate liberty by breaking that personal relation and interacting with so many other people. So yes, you have a thousand masters, but that allows you to be free because you're not dependent upon any of them. I, could you tell me your name? Tyler. 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 If Tyler, for some reason, um, had an issue with the person who served her lunch today, that person said, I really don't like it. I don't like your sunglasses. I'm not going to give you lunch. It's a trivial reason, but unfortunately, it, it tells you the, the, the um, discretion that a master can have. And if that person was the only person from which Tyler could get lunch, Tyler would be without lunch. And he, if that person said, you're still wearing those sunglasses. I really don't like those sunglasses. I'm not going to give you dinner either. She would go without dinner as well. But what if instead she, she did say that, or he did say that? What would you have done? Yeah. She goes to a different line. Or what if nobody on campus is going to serve you any food? Exactly. So she's not dependent on the whim of that person who gave her lunch. She has said, well, fine. You don't give me lunch, I'll go somewhere else. So nobody has a one master anymore. You have many. But that allows you to gain the freedom to do what you think is best for yourself. Is this OK so far? The other reason why Smith believes that markets and morality can go hand in hand is because Smith believes that markets may help you to develop impartiality. And as I said, the impartiality is the base for justice. For Smith, impartiality is not something that comes with us at birth. Impartiality is something that is learned through life. And uh, the way in which Smith describes our development of impartiality is very similar to the way in which you can th think of how we learn di to perceive distances. So I'm going to, to ask you to do, to do something for me. Um, 
the one of you who have a piece of paper who are writing, can you take that piece of paper and put it close to your nose? As close as you can to your nose. Can you read what is written on the paper? Not really. Not really. <laughs> can you read what is written here? Not really? Not really. Why? Why can't you read what is written on your paper when the paper is close to your nose or when I hold the paper? Say again? Yes. If something is on your nose, it's too close to you to be able to see it correctly. What you see is a blur, right? But and it, similarly, if something is here, it's too far away. What do you see? A blur. So something is too close to you becomes a blur. And how big is it? Do you have something written on it? If you put it close to your nose, how big does it look? Giant letters. <laughs> and here? Yes. Something that is close to you looks very big. And something that is far away looks very small. So Smith tells you, well, the way in which you, un you learn how big something is, is not by birth, but is through experience. How? Because if I, um, from here, there is a camera down there, so I apologize, you turn around, if you don't mind. Because if, if, if you all cover the camera with your hand, put your hand in front of you and try to cover the camera, can you do it? <laughs> it's all covered, right? Now, uh, uh, the lady who's actually handling the camera, can you come in front and put your hand in front? Now, can she cover the whole camera? Not the whole thing. Like, if I put my hand here, I can cover the whole thing. She can't, right? Does she mean that her hand is much smaller than mine? <laughs> but that's exactly what Smith is telling you. It's like, you know that the camera is bigger than your hand, even if you're able to cover the camera with your hand, because you have been close to the camera and you've seen that your hand is not as big as the camera. It's just that you, it feels like it is smaller than your hand because you're at distance. Does it make sense? Yeah? So Smith tells you that is how you learn distances. You learn that the mountains outside the windows, because that's the example that he uses, are bigger than the window, even though they look smaller than the window because they are framed by the window. But they're bigger. How do you know? Well, because you've been outside and you saw that the mountains are bigger than your window. You've been close to the mountains and they don't fit your window anymore. So by putting yourself close and far away from objects, you're able to determine how big they are and then you sort of, by habit, you pick up that, that, that um, ability to figure out that if something is far away, it looks small but is actually big, and if something is close, it's big, uh, looks big but is actually small. So Smith tells you, you do the same also for your passions. If, uh, say that I injure myself with paper, like I got a paper cut. I'm like, ah, paper cut. It's horrible. Like it, it, it hurts. When you do it, doesn't it hurt? And you think, like, ah, this is, is bad, and then it, it burns, and you, uh, you think you get infected. It's a big deal when you get a paper cut. But then you think, what if instead somebody lost his leg? What is a bigger deal? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but no, 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 that's exactly the answer. That's, that, that's a normal answer. It's like, for you, what is more important is your paper cut. It's your finger. If some, like Joe Smith in uh, Colorado lost his leg, who cares? <laughs> is Joe Smith, do you know Joe Smith in Colorado? Do you ever see him? No. And so Smith tells you something is far away, looks very tiny to you. Just like the camera looks tiny. My hand is much bigger. Right? So I, my, my natural reaction is to think, who cares about Joe Smith? 
is like an unknown guy in Colorado, far away. Lost it like that, too bad. My paper cut is my finger, close. That's what, what Smith tells you, the example is very similar. Smith tells you if you're told that you're going to lose your little finger overnight or next, uh, tomorrow, are you going to be able to sleep tonight? No, you're gonna, <gasps> I'm gonna lose my little finger. But then Smith tells you also, if you heard that tomorrow the entire population of China is going to be swollen by an earthquake, what are you going to do? <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna sleep placidly through the night, no problem. Right? Because it's something, f China for Smith is, is like as far away as you can get. So in that sense, this is why you use the, 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 the example of China. So if something is far away, is, is very small to you, something is close, very big. Tr trans translate this into, more, in, into moral sense. Right? So let me tell you, if something happens to you, big deal. It's a huge deal, because it's me that happened to you. It happened to me. If somebody happens to the gentleman over there, I don't know, who are you? I have never seen him before. I would never see him again, I don't care. <laughs> so Smith tells you, you, you are going to be much more affected by things that happen to you than by things that happen to the gentleman over there. I'm not even gonna ask your name because you're far away, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but that means that my judgment is going to be very biased. No, I just, no, no. I, Something happened to me, right? It's me, not you, it's me. It's much more important because it's me. I am biased toward myself. Just like I am biased against uh, the gentleman over there because it's too far away. I don't care, I've never met him before. Does it make sense? Yes? That's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. Smith tells you this situation is our normal situation, right? So we are, we are born with a tendency of egocentrism, today we would, we would say. We care about me, 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 and not about anybody else. I come first. If that is the case, if I actually I cut my, my finger and I come here, right now, as Maria Paganelli talking to you, say, oh, I cut my finger, this is horrible, it really hurts. What do you think of me? And I keep like for an hour, ah, my finger, my finger. <laughs> but I'm whining. Yeah, because I am, right? <laughs> but it's still my finger. It's like I got the paper cut. It's a big deal for me. But I th you think she's not completely normal. Like she's whining for an hour about the paper cut. They just get over it, right? Because you're far away from me. You don't feel the same itchiness that I have about my, my, my paper cut. You don't care as much as I do about my finger. Because it's not yours, it's mine. Right? Now, Smith tells you, when uh, this natural tendency to think about yourself also is balanced by another tendency. Do you like to be liked? Or do you like to be hated? And the gentleman behind? Hmm? What? <laughs> you like people that, ah, look at him, that. Right. You prefer to be liked. Yeah, you prefer to be liked. <laughs> Everybody prefer to be liked than prefer to be hated. We like to be liked. We want to be liked. We don't want to be hated. We don't want to be seen as whiners because whining is not a good thing, right? It's not an appropriate behavior. So. I want you to like me, and so even if I have my paper cut, I am not going to whine too much about my paper cut in front of you, because I know that if you were here, like, oh, my paper cut, my finger, I would say, oh, that lady is just a pain. And so I would do that for you, and I know that you are going to do it for me. And so if I cut my finger with paper, I keep my mouth shut because I like to be liked. Does it make sense? So the, the tendency is indeed, if you just leave it by itself, it's a disaster, right? Because you can't have social interactions. 
Because if I think only about myself, and you think only about yourself, can we ever have anything in common? No. I can't talk to you because you're going to talk about yourself. I'm going to talk about myself. So that alone tells you like you can't function as a society or as an individual if everybody thinks exclusively about themselves and think that their problems are the most important problem in the world because I am the center of the universe. As Mick tells you, you think you are the center of the universe until you find somebody else who also thinks that he is yeah, the center of the universe and then you have a problem. And to overcome the problem, we are, we are <laughs> equipped with this desire to be liked. Or as Mitz more correctly say, to be likable, to be lovable, which means I want to be loved and to be lovely so that you will like me and love me. And that tones me down and allows me to um, not to whine all the time about my paper cut. Yeah, the hand up, yeah. Exactly, okay. exactly. So that's the first step that Smith tells you. But then it says, if you do it all the time, if all the time that you have a paper cut, you have to pretend that it's not there, it's not that important. And then you do it again and again and again. Eventually, Smith says, habit allows you to internalize that. And so at the beginning, it's forced. But eventually, with habit, with repetition, with the continuous interaction with others, you're able to eventually internalize. It's not, never going to be perfect, because human beings are not going to be able to, to be perfect. So you always have that tendency, like, oh, my paper cut. But nevertheless, it will tone down in time as you learn. Does it make sense? Yes. Yes. So it's not something we only learn through interaction with that. We we come equipped with self love and desire to be lovely. So I I it's genuine as like as we, we are hardwired with that desire. Um, it's not something that we learn. We learn how to use it, but not the desire is, is in us. Is okay so far? Um, I'm going to ask a personal question. Um, to, to, I would like some of you to raise their hand if that, that, if that is the case. Um, anybody who have been in a relationship and then broke up? Oh, all of you, almost all of you. <laughs> who, has been, who has been the victim of the breaking up? Meaning who has not initiated the breakup? The lady over there. Like, yes, you, you are? Yes, uh, my name is Cora. Cora. Hi. Cora. <laughs> <laughs> so Cora, I'm going to use this as an example. I hope you don't mind. When uh, um, you like the person that you were dating? Yeah. And uh, what happened when you broke up? When he broke up, or she broke up? You were sad. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Like, were you like, oh, I'm sad? <laughs> Put on my sad face. Uh, you cried? Yeah. Yes. By yourself? Uh, yeah, a few times, I would say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only by yourself, or you also cried with somebody? Uh, with whom? Huh? With whom? Your friends. Your friends, exactly. So if something bad happens to you, like a breakup, um, <coughs> were you a student of, I'm sorry. Yeah. Was she a student of Dr. Bear? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Sh you were a student of his? Yeah, I was a student of Dr. Bear. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why didn't you? <laughs> Why? Oh, no, 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 not during the class. But like, why didn't you go to his office and cry on his shoulder in his <laughs> office? <laughs> yes, 
Because you're not, what, what would you expect, what could have happened if you went to his office and started crying and said, oh, my boyfriend just dumped me. <laughs> yes, that's exactly the point. So if you had to talk to him, what, would you do, what, do, what did you do when you had to talk to him? That's exactly the point. That's exactly Smith's point. If something bad happens to you, who do you go to? To your best friends. Why? Because they allow you to cry on their shoulders. You don't go to your professors because it would be kind of awkward, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, they are nice, I'm sure, that like he's a wonderful person, but what could he have told you? <laughs> Basically, yes. On the, other on, the, on the other hand, your friends, <laughs> your friends would say, ah, yeah, he was a jerk, right? But a, your professor would not unlikely have said, oh, yeah, he was a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> you get different reaction from different people. You care and you're drawn to your closest friends in the moment of despair, I'm using Smith's word, because they are the one that allows you to cry on their shoulder. They are, they are the ones that allow you to indulge in your passions. On the other hand, if you go into your professor's office, he's not gonna allow you to indulge in your passions because he's not close to you, right? So you are going to pretend that everything is okay, take a big breath and say, hello, have a good day, and every, pretend to have a big smile in your face, and everything is fine. So Smith tells you, if you stay close to your friends, you're going to cry and cry and cry and cry and cry, and keep crying. If you're by yourself, even more crying. In front of people that you, acquaintances, you don't cry that much. If you go to the grocery store or out in a restaurant, you're not going to start crying at the cash register. For the same reason, why you're not gonna cry in your professor's <laughs> office. <laughs> well, some people may. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> it is less likely that you do it. It may, it may not be intentional, but it, it is less likely that you do it when you are in front of the cash register and you are in with your friends. So Smith tells you, if you want to pretend that everything is okay, be with strangers, not with your close friends. If you are with your close friends, you're going to overindulge in yourself and everything is big. Your breakup is the end of the world. And it's not just a breakup. That happens to everybody. Like all of you raise your hand with the, with the breakup. So it's not that important. And all of you are, are perfectly fine. You're not you're traumatized a little bit, but you move on. <laughs> but at that time, because it's you, is a big deal. Again, you're biased by the, the closeness. Your friends are close to you, so they let you be biased. Strangers, they don't know who you are. Or they may know your name, but they are not close. And so they don't let you indulge in your passion. They force you to, com to compose yourself. And a habit, if you do it over and over again, if you are forced to interact with strangers again and again and again, you're forced to put up that smile, and eventually, <coughs> you're gonna smile. And eventually, your problems do not seem as big, and are not as big, right? So Smith tells you, you are able to develop that impartiality, or get rid of all the biases that you have, by interacting with people that do not allow you to, to support those biases. So who are these people? Not your close friends, because they are the one on which you're crying, on the, on the shoulder of whom you're crying. Those are strangers. Where do you find strangers? In what kinds of societies do you find strangers? In a very small society where everybody knows each other? Or in a big town where you have no idea of the name of the person who served you lunch? So commercial societies are, are societies of interaction with others that are not personal, which means you don't have to know them. 
people are, are away from you. They don't know who you are, or they may know your name, but they may know who you are uh, just by face, but they don't know who you are. And so those kind of continuous interaction with strangers allow you to get rid of your biases much faster that instead you were surrounded only by your family or only by a small group of people that know you very well. And so Smith tells us commercial societies, by the mere fact that they force you to interact with strangers on a constant base, they are a wonderful gym in a sense for that um, habit of putting up a fake smile that eventually becomes a real smile. Does it make sense? Hmm? So this is what Smith tells us, these are his words, and I said I, I, I'm indulging myself in this case uh, because I really like them. Are you in adversity? This is from Theory of the Moral Sentiments. Are you in adversity? Do not born in the darkness of solitude. Do not regulate your sorrow according to the indulgent sympathy of your intimate friends. See, the, the, the lady was crying on, on her friend's shoulders. Return as soon as possible to the daylight of the words and to society. Live with strangers, with those who know nothing and care nothing about your misfortune. <laughs> and if you're forced to go to your professor's office who knows nothing about your mis misfortune, what do you do? Hello. Nice day today, huh? And eventually, as Smith tells you, if you continue doing it, you're able to um, unbias yourself from uh, the huge perspective of uh, my problem. Does it make sense? <coughs> so these are the three reasons why Smith thinks that markets foster morality. But Smith also tells you, you can, the, the relationship goes both ways. You can't have functioning markets without morality. So it's not just a one-way one street. It has to go both ways. You have to have morality to foster markets. If you have no morality, markets collapse. Again, think of, the, of my purse example. If for every transaction that you make, you have to make sure that the transaction is enforced because the other person is going to steal from you. How many of you would buy stuff online? How many of you would buy stuff from people that you've never met before? Would you actually buy food or get food from somebody who you've never seen before who may actually give you junk, junk in a sense like trash to eat just because they can? So if morality is not there, transaction costs become immense. If justice is not present, society falls apart. If, uh, um, so morality is a precondition or is a condition that allows market to emerge and to, uh, and to grow. Just as much as morality is something that comes out of markets, in a sense, that is fostered by, mar by markets. But then Smith tells you, you know what? Markets generate all these wonderful things. Commerce generates all this wonderful wealth that allows you to do wonderful things. But <coughs> that's not the end of the story. If, uh, um, if you have a huge pot of wealth right there, a huge pot of money, you may also have temptations to grab it. And commerce generates that wealth that is available to be grabbed. And Smith gives us the examples of lobbying as examples in which you have small groups that say, ooh, there's a lot of money there. I'm going to grab it for myself in ways that are not necessarily moral. So Smith tells you you have to be careful because wh when you have a lot of wealth available, you generate the incentive to grab that wealth in, illegal, in uh, immoral ways. And the consequences of it 
are going to be very bad. Very bad in the sense that they are going to break down the mechanisms of market and eventually also bring death, the Bengal example that I mentioned before. And so um, a special interest group is a group that lobbies the government to get special privileges to break the standard uh, um, institution of markets to their own benefits at the expense of society. And they know that, that everybody is going to be worse off, but I am better off. And if you do it, growth decreases. It decreases so much, as I said, you can think of the example of Bengal that I gave before that actually brings death because you, you, you don't have enough to eat. Is this okay? So this is a beautiful story that Smith tells us. What do we do with it in France? <laughs> is it just like blah, 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 that Smith said in the, in the, um, in the 18th century? This is a question, so like the, the problem of the interaction of uh, markets and morality is a problem that has contemporary relevance. Um, and so there are s some economists who, not because of Smith, of course, but for, because of the, of the question that Smith asked, are looking at the same problem with different tools. And the tools, some of the tools that economists uh, are using today is experimental economics or experiments. So we are able to test these ideas, not in their details, in like broad brushes um, uh, ideas. And uh, there are sets of experiments done both in the fields and in the laboratory that seem to more or less indicate that the broad picture that Smith describes has some grounding. Now, what does this mean? Um, I said we can't test Smith's theory by itself because it's just too complex. So as I mentioned before, trust is one way of looking at morality. Right? So do I do something because it's the right thing or not? If, I, if she says, well, I'm not stealing your wallet because it's not mine, I trust her that she's not going to do it. So trust can be seen as a variable um, that picks up in very broad and imperfect ways morality. And uh, there are games that are designed in experiments. Experiments are basically um, um, games done under controlled situations, in controlled situations, so that you can change one thing holding everything else the same so you're able to see whether that variable is actually what matters. So there are games that are designed um, to see how much um, you would trust others or under what conditions you are able to trust others. So one game um, that, is, um, uh, that is used is uh, um, allows you to see whether the, if you give something to somebody else, that person is going to reciprocate and give you something back. Or if instead you are able to give, you are willing to give something to somebody else just for the sake of it, just because it's the right thing to do. So these are all games, trust games, ultimatum games, dictator games. I'm just using words. Have you, have you heard these words before? No, that's fine. So the, these are all games that are meant to see whether people behave in a selfish way or in a way that shows some care for others, some form of morality. It just is the right thing to give to somebody who doesn't have. Um, I'm going to use, I'm going to explain one, can I? I'm going to explain one game just very, very easily um, so that you get a better sense of what goes on. I'm going to use a dictator game because it's the easiest one to see. Um, remind me your name. 
Mario. So Mario, I give Mario ten dollars, and I tell Mario, these are ten dollars. These are for you. There is somebody else in a different room, in the other room, uh, that I put there, um, and you can give any amount of these ten dollars to the other person. Whatever you give them, the person goes home with it. Whatever you keep, you go home with. What are you going to do? All of it? Yes. yes. That's the standard answer that you would get from an economic model. You keep the whole thing for yourself, and you leave the other person with nothing. If you ask enough people this question, the, um, about a third of the people will answer like Mario does. But another third is actually going to give the person in the other room five dollars out of those ten. Mm -hmm. So here you have a problem. The, 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 meat, the, the average giving is about uh, three dollars because there are people like Mario that give nothing and there are... No, <laughs> is this, <I'm> not, <laughs> It was, it was not a criticism, it was like that's just like about a third of the people behave like Mario and a third of the people give something um, around five dollars. On average, people give about three dollars. If you take the model of economics seriously, you should all behave like Mario, like everybody should behave like Mario. So here you run into this major problem, like why are 30% of the people giving 50% of the pot? And you can't explain it. There is nothing within our theory, the economic theory, that allows you to come up with an explanation for why people give money away for no reasons. They get nothing in return. There's absolutely nothing there to, 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 to gain if you give $5 to the other person. This is why Mario didn't do it. Right? Does it make sense? Um, some, in some examples, yes, and the common answer is because it's the right thing to do. Yes? What does the last part mean? Uh, it gives in between, any, any amount between zero and five. Um, so this, this experiment has been done over and over and over and over again in the United States, in Europe, with about the same result with all kinds of people, like college students, professionals, people in the street, people with no education, people with high education. Everybody behaves more or less in the same way. So much that you say, well, this may be something that comes hardwired with us. And so a group of, of anthropologists, psychologists, economists, and sociologists decided to test this to see whether indeed we are hardwired to give out money for free to random people in the other room. And so they went in the field, which means they went in um, um, parts of the world that are, um, are not in a, in a school, in a laboratory. Um, and they went in particular to uh, villages where the, the villagers have basically no interactions with others. So these are um, like bush people, like people in, uh, in, the, um, in the forest or in the middle of nowhere, with the living huts, like small groups. Um, and, uh, and it's like, okay, let's see how you behave. Because if it is hardwired that we are generous with others, then they should behave the same way. Exactly, exactly. And what they found out is that we are not hardwired in that way. The results that the anthropologists found are very different in non-industrialized societies and in industrialized societies. As a matter of fact, there are the majority of the uh, non-industrialized societies behave closer to economic theory, to homo economicus, to Mario, than the than the, um, um, than we expected. So the majority of people in non-industrialized society gives very little or close to nothing. 
There in particular, Hendrik um, himself, the village that he studied, was the lowest one of all, oh, in terms of giving. So here you run into another problem, like why in America or in Europe people give about half of the pot and instead in uh, some places in uh, the middle of nowhere with no interaction, with no, no contact, no markets, they give close to nothing. Yes? I'm curious, what, what do they give to? I mean, I guess in protest and in peace and everything. It depends on the, the villages because like every... So for one specific area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. In one, uh, in one of these experiment, in one of these villages, you had a natural experiment, meaning that um, part of the, popul the population is the same, right? The, the, the same village, but some of the people in the village go to work in a different part of uh, of the country for a wage, and part of the village instead stays in the village um, with sub subsistence, so they, they don't have any interaction with others. Part of them instead go work for a wage and then come back. Same people though, so same families. And what happened when you had the same experiment done with those, you had different results. The people who go work for wages behave like industrialized people. The people who stayed in the village without um, having any interaction with, uh, with others behave like the others. They don't give. So here you have a very puzzling <coughs> result that really puzzled them significantly. Um, that like, why are people who have, they call it um, market interactions, are going to be more willing to give than people who do not? Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Thanks. Somebody had a hand up? Yes. Yeah, that, that's one of the problems that they had, right? Because they weren't, they weren't expecting that kind of results. So they went back in, 2000, in a study that was published in 2010 in Science um, to study exactly that. And what they found is that of all the variables that you can think of, the only one that matters is market integration. And in the 2010 study, they also studied a religion. So it's monotheistic religion the exposure of, to monotheistic religion and uh, market integration are the only two variables that explain um, the, uh, the differences in giving. Yes? Is it just monotheistic religion? Like it's like yeah. At least that's what they, look, they asked or they looked at. Um, um, I also was puzzled by this. And so I asked a group of experimentalists to try to replicate this in the lab. Um, and what we came up was an experiment where we expose subjects to, uh, subjects as students, so you guys basically, um, to markets. And as a result, the people who are exposed to markets tend to be more trusting than people who are not exposed to markets. Um, <coughs> And so to conclude, I hope that I, um, that I show that for Smith, or at least within the Smithian tradition, um, and in Smith in particular, the idea of moral markets is not an oxymoron. It is, those are two compatible words. As a matter of fact, there are two words, uh, two concepts that go hand in hand. And the markets are able to support and be supported by morality. The two are not distinct, they're not in conflict with each other necessarily. Um, and this helped us also explain some of the results from experimental economics and Smith help us understanding those results that otherwise would be a puzzle. So thank you. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.